several of my friends had gone to what was the earliest manifestations of what became the community college. They were up on the Riviera campus. They had some connection with the college at the very, very beginning. And this was back in the, what, 60s, I think, 1960s. So I just had this vague kind of impression of the fact that there was a college there. But that, as I say, it was very vague. So one of Joe's friends, actually, recommended me to the other board. So I came to the rest of the other board members. So I came up and was interviewed several times. And at, the time, at that time, I was working out in Isla Vista. So I, and I had recently graduated from uh, UCSB as a re-entry woman. Not only that, I had three children in college. So it seemed to the board that I was able to present all these factors I was a businesswoman of Carpinteria. You know, I met several, several of the criteria that they wanted as a board member. So I was appointed. And I think the election would have been two years later, two or three years later. Well, nobody ran against me. So I was very, very lucky in that regard. There wasn't anyone else from Carpinteria at that point that said, we want to run. So then that was the beginning. I was unopposed. Uh, for the rest of the time that I was on, on, which was something like 32 years, they've had board members who were really active in the community. And the fact that we uh, were elected by district made that possible. Because, for example, I think there were three board members from uh, downtown Santa Barbara. So they were either usually business people and they had some outreach into the community. Then the same way with Goleta. Goleta had one, Carp had one, uh, Montecito had one. But you didn't get elected to this board or be a, uh, asked to be on it if you weren't pretty active in, the, in that group. So you already had the outreach going on. And then part of your job was to continue that outreach, to continue to be, you were a politician without being a partisan politician. And that was one of the really important things. As soon as we came on the board, that was one of the first things that we were instructed, that we were not to engage in partisan politics, that that was absolutely beyond the pale. You might have issues that you are interested in, specifically more than others, but you better not start dragging any kind of political uh, baggage with you onto the board, and everybody respected that. And of course, it was easier then because the parties weren't so politicized. But anyway, that was uh, adult ed was our real outreach into the community. Except the ironic part of that was that nobody realized adult ed was being run under City College. I mean, for a long time, everybody thought it was separate. I think in some cases they still do. They don't realize that they're a part of the college. But the people at the college always felt like, well, why don't they understand what we're trying to do because they're adult ed students. So there's always been a tension between the two entities. I think everybody would agree with that. Sam Wake was such a strong uh, administrator in the beginning. And he really thought adult, he thought of adult ed, I think, as being a separate uh, entity the whole time. So everybody else's focus was trying to bring those two entities together. Enough buildings here, there was enough structure, actually infrastructure, to uh, make you feel as if it wa a, a, was a, or a, a legitimate place of learning. And then, of course, a lot got up here. That crazy Glenn Gooder that was president when I came on the board was a fabulous uh, kind of cheerleader. And he was determined he was going to make this place work, even though we were all kind of feeling our way, because the board had only been functioning for maybe 10, 
seven or eight years before I came on. So people were, I mean, it was really adventuresome. It was a, a idea, we're all in this together, we're gonna to make it work. And he was great, I mean, he just brought that out in everybody. But there were three committees. There was facilities, there was educational policies, and there was but finance, budget and finance. Everybody wanted to be on facilities because that was the exciting, uh, you know, we're building, we're buying, we're bidding, we're, and uh, when Eli Luria came on, who was the Montecito member after Jim Garvin, the original member, Eli had been in the construction business, construction and development. So he always chaired that committee, but the rest of us were fighting to be, <laughs> to be one of the members because that was you know, a really fun and exciting place to be. The other one that everybody wanted to be on was Ed Policies because educational policies covered all the other governance of the college beside what was happening in facilities. Nobody wanted finance because that was, you know, pretty boring. <laughs> Although that was one of the things that Glenn Gooder did. He managed to make the finance committee interesting. <laughs> and of course, this was before uh, it was before the staff, the classified staff, and the faculty were it, in the, it had collective bargaining. So Glenn's idea was that we would just all go out somewhere and have coffee and we would just talk about, you know, what everybody wanted to do and it was very collegial. I think it was, he, he did a great job of making us feel that we were part of the team. Peter, Peter started in 83, I think, and there had been some uh, Dave Murdy's had been here. I think Glenn was here for seven, eight years, and then Dave Murdy's was here for four years. But when Peter came in, he really pulled everything together. And I think we were able to function so effectively as a board because he was such an effective uh, leader of the college. He was one of the best listeners I have ever met. He had the ability to go into a meeting and listen or bring out, actually encourage everybody to contribute. And then at the end of that meeting, when everybody was just kind of sitting there, he would capsulize the whole thing and gosh, we had made a decision. It's fun. I wouldn't have done it for that long if it hadn't been fun. And the reason it was fun was because all the board members uh, respected each other, even though we insulted each other <laughs> sometimes. But, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, have st I wouldn't have stuck with it. And I think the rest of the people felt that way too. Also, it was the most rewarding um, public service or volunteer work that you could do because there was actually something getting accomplished. It wasn't just go to meetings, go to meetings, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was, you could actually see that we were building something, that the community was benefiting from it, our kids were benefiting from it, because I think we all had children that were in college age at the time. There are a lot of students who can't afford uh, even the state colleges, or they don't live close enough to the state colleges to be able to attend. And having those, uh, the universities now can't take, they can only take, what, a quarter of the people who graduate or are eligible. I mean, many, many kids get turned away from, from uh, the universities that are qualified to go there. So it is, a, it's a great source of satisfaction to all of us, I think to everybody in the community, and that's one reason City College has always had such great support. The staff at City College has always been under-recognized. I think the faculty, you know, because of the fact that they are experts in their own field, and so they tend to be listened to more in other fields, but the staff have labored away for years and years, I think, 
two of the people that I will never forget that worked here were was Elsie uh, uh, Glenn Gooder's secretary in the office, Elsie, I've forgotten her last name, and Alma, who was in Peter McDougall's office, and they were absolutely held everything together when it could have been coming apart because they kept a really tight ship on appointments. They kept track of the board members. They got us there to the, for example, if um, if somebody couldn't attend one of these subcommittee meetings, which were held pretty often, the secretary would get on the phone and she would call the other board members and she would say, even if it was only with two hours notice, so-and-so can't come, can you fill in? So one of the other board members would go and fill in at that meeting. And the, uh, so that was, they saw that as part of their role, was to keep things moving smoothly. We're all here to do what's best for the students. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. Nobody discussed politics. And I think the, day, the only danger that uh, we thought we were going to face was when the um, staff, classified staff, and the faculty uh, voted to do collective bargaining. And as a board, we thought, uh-oh, this is going to be a problem because it's going to drive us farther apart than, it, than the kind of pretty collegial way that we had been doing. But it didn't happen that way because the people who were um, uh, representing those two entities were just as anxious to make it work as we were. So again, because we, everybody respected each other and we all had this idea that we wanted to uh, do the best thing possible with the resources that we had. And shared governance, people, that became a watchword later, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Well, we had been doing shared governance for years. We just never called it that. So it was astounding to us to find out that, or to hear other colleges didn't operate in the same way that we had.